All right, these are your notes for the hair and fibers unit of forensics. Hair at the crime scene. Hair is considered class evidence. Uh, we cannot individualize hair on its own um, unless the follicle is present. If the follicle is present, which is like the skin that the hair grows out of, then we're able to extract DNA, but a hair on its own cannot be individualized. Often hair is involved in secondary transfer. That's when hair can easily adhere to clothes, carpets, and other surfaces, and then be transferred to other locations. For example, if you're at home, your dog sits on your lap, leaves a dog hair behind, and then you come to school, that dog hair could be found on the floor of school. That doesn't mean the dog was there. That means that the hair was involved in secondary transfer, was transferred from one location to another by you. Uh, this is particularly common with animal hair. Because of the tough outer coating of hair, it does not easily decompose. It can decompose, but it takes a very long time. Um, so normally hairs are able to be recovered from most crime scenes. <clears throat> when we analyze hair, it helps us to determine if the hair is from a human or an animal. We can determine kind of a broad racial background of an individual based on the hair. We can determine what body region the hair is from, whether it's from their head or another body area. We can determine the manner in which the hair was removed, whether it was shed naturally or whether it was forcefully pulled. We can also test the hairs for drugs and other toxins like heavy metals. Uh, we can also test it for any nutritional deficiencies. Um, that's particularly helpful in cases where someone has been like, kidnapped or held captive or in um, neglect situations. If the follicle is present, like I mentioned before, DNA evidence can be obtained. All hair, regardless of what organism it comes from, has the same basic structure with two parts. There's a follicle and then there's a shaft. The follicle is the club-shaped structure in the skin from which the hair grows. That's this like lower portion here. It's kind of like club-shaped, this like bulb shape almost that the hair is going to grow out of. The hair shaft is the longer portion of the hair. It's composed of keratin, which is a protein, and it makes that keratin makes the hair strong and also flexible. The hair shaft itself has three different layers. It has a cuticle on the outside, a cortex, which is kind of in the middle, and a medulla, which is the very center. When we look at the cuticle, uh, the cuticle is the transparent outer layer of hair. Uh, its job is to protect the hair. Uh, it's made of different scales of keratin that can overlap, and they point towards the tip of the hair. So for example, on this one, this would be the top of the hair pointing towards the tip of the hair. Different mammals have different cuticle scale patterns. For example, this kind of square shape, that's characteristic of a mouse. This, like, what they call spinous is characteristic of a cat. Humans have this kind of, like, overlapping scale pattern. Uh, this is called imbricate. That's the pattern found in humans, and it's found in a lot of other animals, too. So just because you see that it's imbricate doesn't mean it's human, but that is one indication that it could be a human hair. Uh, the spinous pattern is found on mink, seals, cats, uh, but never found on humans. We will never have a human with the spinous um, trait. Uh, it's more for, if you think of animals with like a greasy or almost like waterproof coating, that's what their cuticle is like. This coronal pattern is found in small rodents like mice, but it can rarely be found in humans. So just because we see coronal, we can't eliminate um, humans from a possibility, but it is rare. <clears throat> the cortex is the middle layer of the hair shaft. It's the largest part. It makes up the bulk of the hair. The cortex is the area that contains the pigment uh, that will make the hair uh, a darker color. In humans, that pigment will create a brown, black, blonde, or red colors. The cortex provides the strength and determines the texture of the hair. So it determines whether the hair is going to be coarse or fine. I'm not going to spend too much time looking at the cortex. We are going to spend quite a bit of time looking at the medulla. The medulla is the very central core of the hair. So it's the very, very center portion. So these are all like cross sections of a hair. Uh, the medulla can be hollow or it can be filled with different cells. Forensic investigators are going to classify hair into five groups depending on the appearance of that medulla. 
if it is a continuous medulla, that would be this top one here. It is one unbroken line of color. If it's interrupted, it will be a pigmented line broken at regular intervals. <coughs> so it follows a predictable pattern of breaks. Fragmented is similar, but the breaks are unevenly spaced. So unevenly spaced breaks in the pigmented line. Solid is going to be a pigmented area that fills both the medulla and the cortex. So notice continuous is just that thin portion. Solid means it fills almost the entire hair. Or it could be absent. There could be no pigmentation in the, in the medulla like this bottom one here. So continuous, interrupted, fragmented, solid, or none. Here are some examples of what we would see under a microscope of different medullas. Um, the dog here is a good example of a fragmented one. The deer is a good example of a solid. It goes from edge to edge of the hair. The entire thing is pigmented. Uh, you can see that other organisms like a rabbit and a cat, they have all sorts of different patterns in the medulla. We're not going to get um, that into detail with it, um, but that is one way that or that scientists can determine what organism it came from is by these different patterns. Human hairs generally will have no medulla or they will have a fragmented medulla. So if you look at this one here, it's fragmented. Uh, it has breaks, but they're at uneven intervals. If it has a continuous medulla, that could be from a Native American or an Asian um, individual because they tend to sometimes have continuous medullas because their hair is so dark. Animal hairs show a very wide variety of medulla patterns like we can see below. The medullary index is determined by measuring the diameter of the medulla and dividing it by the diameter of the hair. The medullary index is going to give us an indication of whether it's uh, human or not. Uh, for example, in a cattle hair, the higher the number, basically the wider the medulla is. So in this cattle hair, we measured the hair diameter and the diameter of the medulla, and then divide them to get a decimal point. This would be a medulla of 0.5 or more. For a human, the number is going to be less than 0.3. So here, if we take the diameter of the hair and the diameter of the medulla, medulla divided by the hair, so medulla, small number on top, large number on the bottom, divide it, and we get a decimal that's less than 0.3, we can assume that it is a human hair animal hair is generally going to be greater than 0.5. If it falls somewhere in between those two, then we would need a little more information to be able to distinguish if it's a human hair or not. Um, there's kind of like that gray area in the center. But generally, the human hair has a very narrow medulla versus animals. Hair can also vary in shape, length, diameter, texture, and color. <clears throat> a cross section of a hair. So if we cut it like the short way we think of, it can give clues as to what type of hair shape that person has. If that hair is round, that would indicate that the person has straight hair. A more oval shape is going to indicate curly or wavy hair. And a crescent shape is going to indicate very tight, um, small curls, which we would call kinky. Hair roots can look different based on whether they were forcibly removed or if they had naturally fallen out. If it is forcibly removed, there will be remnants of a follicle. You will see some skin cells attached to it if it was forcibly removed. Uh, for example, on this one, you can see it's kind of got jagged edges because it was forcibly removed. If it just naturally fell out, it's going to have a more rounded club shaped at the end. Um, we can also look at the hair tips to determine um, when the hair was last cut. So if it's rounded, it's an uncut hair. Scissors would leave like a straight edge, possibly with a little notch. A razor is going to leave more of a slant. A clippers is going to be, again, flat, maybe with some other jagged parts as well. Differences in hair can be used for association or exclusion in forensics. So we would use the term microscopically similar to so again, this is not individual information. We can just say the hair found at the crime scene is microscopically similar to an Asian hair or hair found on an Asian 
or microscopically similar to a dog. Right? We can't say definitively whether it came from a human or a dog or a cat, but we can say that you know it's similar to this or um, if it's microscopically similar to a human, that would mean it's not microscopically similar to a horse. So we could, you know, potentially exclude the fact, exclude the possibility of it being a human, um, but it's not definitive evidence. Uh, not all hairs from one person are exact, exactly the same. For example, a suspect may have a few gray hairs and brown hairs in a sample from their head. Not every single hair you have is the same that makes it very difficult to individualize hairs to a particular person. Uh, when we collect samples of a suspect's hair, typically we collect 50 hairs from their head and 25 or so if they're from the pubic region. When we collect the hairs, we want them to be shed, not cut, because we wanna be able to see the um, follicle part. So this is a picture of how they would collect hair samples, put out a large white piece of paper, have the suspect bend their head over and kind of run their fingers through their hair or the forensic scientist would run their fingers through their hair to get the hairs to naturally shed off. Um, same with any body hair samples, they would do something similar. They're not going to pluck them and they're not going to cut them. They want to have them naturally shed. Fibers. Fibers are the smallest indivisible unit of a textile or of clothing of cloth. Fibers are also class evidence. They're left behind from things like clothing, carpet, furniture, bedding, uh, insulation, or rope. We can often link a fiber to a material or a manufacturer, but we can't necessarily end individualize it to a particular item of clothing. For example, we can say we know it's from a white Fruit of the Loom t-shirt manufactured in Alabama, but we can't say whether or not it's from this one specific shirt found at the crime scene. The fibers help to create links between victims, suspects, and locations. For example, if we find the same fiber on a suspect, on a victim, and in the back of a car, um, that would be circumstantial evidence that, you know, something was in all three of those places. Early collection of fibers is critical in cases. 95% of fiber evidence falls off or is lost within 24 hours. So we want to make sure that if we have a suspect, if we need fiber evidence, if we want to gather fiber evidence, we need to do that very quickly or it will be lost. Fibers are woven into cloth using three different weave patterns. There is plain weave. This is the simplest one. It's the most common weave. Um, when we look at that pattern under a microscope, it resembles just like a checkerboard. We have vertical and horizontal um, fibers that are kind of evenly spaced in both directions. There's also twill. Twill makes sort of a diagonal pattern uh, resembling kind of like stair steps. Denim is the most common example of twill uh, weave. Twill provides a very soft and pliable yet very strong fiber. So under a microscope, we would look for this kind of jagged um, appearance. Then we have satin. Satin weave is a horizontal wide weave. So if we look, this these horizontal pieces skip several uh, skip several fibers before they pop up again. So it's kind of like looks like it's stretched out horizontally. The interlacing may not be uniform, so they're not necessarily evenly spaced. Uh, this type of weave creates shiny fabrics, <coughs> but it does create fabrics that are not very durable. They easily fray. <clears throat> Natural fibers are fibers that come from animals, plants, or from mined minerals. Examples of natural fibers would be wool, which of course comes from sheep. Cashmere uh, comes from goats. Silk comes from silkworms. Cotton comes from a plant. Linen also comes from a plant. And some students are um, don't realize this, but fiberglass is considered a fiber, and that is a natural fiber. It comes from naturally mined silicon and asbestos, um, asbestos that could be on like a construction worker's clothing, for example, that is also a naturally occurring fiber that's made of different minerals. Synthetic fibers are, are fibers that are entirely man-made in a lab or in a factory. 
Examples would be things like rayon, nylon, acrylic, polyester, and spandex. When we look at synthetic fibers, they are going to be much stronger than natural fibers are. Synthetic fibers are not damaged by microorganisms, but natural fibers are. So things like bacteria can break down natural fibers over time. Uh, for example, if a body is left in the woods with cotton clothing, that cotton clothing can decompose just like any other plant matter can. Uh, synthetic fibers do not decompose. Synthetic fibers can deteriorate in the sun. Uh, natural fibers are much more resistant to the elements. Um, synthetic fibers, if they're left under the sun, can become very brittle and deteriorate. Synthetic fibers have a much lower melting point than natural fibers. Synthetic fibers have a very, very regular diameters and a very smooth surface. If you look at it under a microscope, a synthetic fiber, every single fiber is going to have the same width, and they're all going to be very smooth, as we can see on these synthetic fibers here. When we look at natural fibers, they're going to be much more rough. They're not, some may be thicker, some may be thinner um, when we look at them under a microscope. So natural fibers can have an irregular diameters and they will have a more rough surface. When we test fibers, there are non-destructive tests um, in which the sample is still you know, kept intact to be used later. Uh, we can use microscopy, microscopes to look at them. If we have large quantities of the sample, we can do different destructive tests, which would, you know, ruin the sample basically. But if we have enough of it, we can do these following tests. Uh, we can burn the fiber in order to compare the melting point. We can determine if there's any odor, ash, um, if it melts, anything like that. You can see up here that the silk burns, the polyester melts, uh, the cotton burns with a flame, silk leaves, uh, leaves behind ashes. We can also place it in different solvents and compare what solubility. Some fibers will dissolve in things like acetone, others will not. <coughs> we can stain the fibers and, and compare their absorption of various types of stains. We can determine their density. Um, we can use chromatography to give, get a more detailed analysis of what dyes are used in the creation of that textile. And we can do something called thermal decomposition. Thermal decomposition is going to break down the fiber into its simplest monomers. And each fiber will have a unique thermal decomposition. All right, those are the, that is the end of your fiber and hair notes for forensics. Please make sure you complete the document and submit it on Canvas.